Professor Lisa Harvey Smith, Australia's Go Australian government's women in STEM ambassador. Thank you very much for joining us once again on Australia in Space TV. Yeah, it's good to be with you. Thanks very much. Uh, Lisa, we did interview you back in 2021, so it's been a couple of years since we've had you on, but you're uh, you remain in that ambassador role. Uh, we do see you out and about, uh, even on mainstream media. This is on the back of the 2023 STEM Equity Monitor. Uh, maybe a quick update on uh, sort of the outcomes from this and uh, are you encouraged by what you're seeing? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the STEM Equity Monitor is basically where they gather all the data from uh, the past 12 months um, on the STEM workforce and education. So who's participating in it? What subjects are they studying? Um, are they staying in STEM? Uh, and who's actually working in the STEM workforce? So we've gathered this data, the government's gathered it all together um, for the past few years. It's really helping drive the actions that we think need to be taken um, to build our STEM workforce. So basically the, the STEM qualified workforce, um, the highlight is it's grown um, by about 300,000 in the past 10 years. So that's good. It's growing. We know we certainly need uh, to attract good people and train them here in Australia as well. Um, and a third of those people have been women. So the gap between men and women is, is actually closing, but quite slowly. It's gone from 11% to 15% currently. Okay. Um, so we've got a lot more work to do, but we are working on many fronts um, and looking at year 12 enrolments, then high school, what, what students are choosing to study. Um, the gap is actually closing between boys and girls. Um, in science and math, it's now equal between boys and girls. Right. Just in technology and engineering, um, those IT tech type subjects um, where the gap is still quite wide. So we know now where we do and don't have to um, focus our attention. So it's really helpful for us. Okay, so you do find that now sort of the science and the maths potentially taken care of uh, just need to be monitored. Absolutely. Tech and engineering and now. The standards are going up a little bit as well, yeah. Engineering is a tricky one, you know. Um, I'm part of a, a wider group, people from universities and engineering professions who talk about this problem. And, you know, we, we only train 50% of the engineers we need in Australia, so we need to look at that. But also yeah. attracting from overseas is difficult because it's a very competitive global market now. Um, so if we're not training people, um, we're not able to, you know, magically take take people from overseas because everyone wants to do that. Um, it, it's a real problem because these skills are so crucial, especially in the sort of uh, software uh, side of things. Um, but, you know, big construction projects, big design projects, new technologies emerging all the time. And, of course, in the space industry as well, um, we need engineers to be competitive. So, yeah, it's really difficult um, getting things like engineering on the curriculum. Uh, the curriculum is very busy in schools and engineering isn't something people really talk about um, in schools. Often people will do engineering in schools, but they'll call it science. So I think we got a bit of a branding issue. Uh, a lot of things to think about. Is, yeah, is the, is the language used. Um, the federal government's giving some attention at the moment on the tertiary sector and looking at redesigning how universities are functioning, uh, also with Indigenous uh, engagement at, at a tertiary level. Uh, what sort of policy settings do you think uh, might need to be made, both, both at the educational level, but mm -hmm. also we'll, we'll touch on potential industry uh, policy settings that you might uh, feel that need to be tweaked. But, yeah, just in, from a schooling curriculum perspective, any any major reform needed there? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, they're always looking at the curricula. The state and territories have different curricula, and, of course, there's mm -hmm. the national curriculum. So all of that's very crowded. Um, I think sometimes that can be a little bit of fiddling, but really uh, the thing is that um, a lot of STEM teachers need support to understand the career pathways that are available. And actually it's about connecting up the education, the higher tertiary education sector and vocational training sector with educators to, to help them understand those pathways and help young people make good decisions. Um, and not kind of basing the advice on what was maybe true 30, 40 years ago um, in that generation, but, but on what the case is today. We know a lot of students are studying science degrees um, huge numbers of students are coming out of science degrees and finding they can't find a role in science mm. and in research that they might want to do. So really, I think we need to be a little bit more honest with young people and say, well, these are where the jobs are. Um, here are some of the pathways that could take you there. And why don't you consider some of these these sort of less traditional roles that parents or grandparents might not know about? Um, and then it's helping STEM teachers as well. Sort of STEM teachers are teaching out of field. They may have trained in different areas, um, in non-STEM areas, um, and giving them the help and support that they need to really 
help their young people um, into the, the future that, that we all want to build together. So that's, you know, there's a lot to think about in education. Um, it's a very crowded area and I know a lot of teachers struggle with the, the workload. So thinking about how to clear more time for teachers to um, really shine in their profession and do the things they're really great at would be a terrific outcome, I think. It does sound like a holistic approach is needed to the to the whole thing. There's there's a few moving parts there over time. Yeah. We, we interviewed the Annie Thomas Space Foundation recently. They did a program with 65 schools uh, funded from the Australian Space Agency, I understand, but they had 500 schools of interest uh, in that yeah. program. And so that's a huge gap between sort of you mentioned uh, teachers and the like and the interest there. So do you see that gap as well between what's being funded and the interest? Uh, and then there's a second part to this is uh, one aspect was that was a space program and they found that kids love space, the teachers love space uh, and parents love space as well. Uh, do you, what do you think of the space sector? Cause it's multidisciplinary, uh, has a lot yeah. of sort of aspects of STEM as well, yeah, just on both those two. One, the gap, and then two, your thoughts on the space sector and, and the part that it can play. Yeah, it, 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 space is the gateway drug, science. You know, astronomy is the gateway oh. drug, I think, to, to so much STEM, and that's great. And as an astrophysicist, I'm, I'm going to say that. Um, it, you know, <laughs> okay, you are biased. <laughs> certainly, you know, in, in our discussions, I'm on the advisory board to the Australian Space Agency, and we're always thinking about ways to to actually inspire the next generation using space um, as that engagement tool. Um, but ways, you know, in which um, we can also give people a realistic ex expectation of what space is. Um, I mean, with the gap, I don't know if you're referring to the, the gap between the the interest that young people have in space and, and the opportunities available to them. Is that what you're uh, yeah, alluding they, to? They funded up to 65 schools and when they put it out, uh, they had 500 I schools apply. Yeah, and so not enough. Like, wow, that yeah, you could not have enough. funded 400 and, and still been oversubscribed. Absolutely. Um, again, um, you know, with, with any program, there's always more demand than, than you can satisfy. And I think one of the things that we need to grapple with in this sector is um, there there is always more demand uh, and, and government We'll never provide enough funding you know nobody feels they have enough funding for anything um they're, they're, it's just going to be a perpetual problem so what we need to do is connect industry into this and a lot of people come to me from companies and say well how do we hire um more women into our industry and i say well what do you tr what have you tried and they say well we put out an advert <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, you know, it, it, it's 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 a try a bit harder and connect more, um, integrate this into your strategy, uh, your business strategy into your long long term planning, because in the modern world, like securing that pipeline of talent um, is no longer as simple as putting out a job advert. Um, and I think people have to get to grips with this, even SMEs and SMEs are a really important part of the, uh, the space uh, sector here in Australia, of course. Um, but actually banding together and, and demanding sort of a, a greater strategic approach um, collectively uh, to this problem, um, helping to fund and support great programs, National Youth Science Forum or, you know, this anti Andy Thomas program. Um, it, there are so many great programs out there, but coordination is something that, that I think we can work harder on. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a really exciting future that we can think of for the space sector but are we going to grasp those opportunities are we going to work together um, to make sure that not only are kids getting an, a realistic idea of the pathways are they seeing the engineering are they seeing the software development are they seeing the machine learning opportunities um, or are they just seeing science and that has a lot to do with the media it has a lot to do with the you know, the science communicators, like people like myself, um, yeah. and the things that we talk about and the way we talk about our industry. So we've all got a role to play in um, in creating that future. Well, and you obviously play that as quite a significant role in the work that you do. There's a couple of other reports that come out. Do you have a program of work in relation to this? So we see the Workplace Gender Equity Report. Uh, there's uh, evaluating STEM equity programs. So there is you know, a, a range of guidelines and programs that you are developing, as you say, to, to guide policy and uh, for to provide resources, uh, I suppose, for people to refer to? Yeah, that's it. I mean, in my role as uh, Women in STEM Ambassador, really I started in the role 
you know, thinking about um, how to advocate for change and, and to help people to create change in education and business settings. So workplaces are improved um, and more inclusive. Um, people can hire um, people from backgrounds that are not traditionally taking part in their, in their um, workplaces. But they need guidance, they need help because a lot of companies are SMEs, they're small um, they maybe don't have gigantic uh, marketing or human resources departments. They don't, maybe don't know what to do. So um, I build up a research team now doing a lot of research and trying to understand the barriers, but then the solutions. Um, and as you alluded to, we're doing a lot of work on how to evaluate and design really effective programs within workplaces. Um, and uh, all those resources are available for free on our website and women in STEM org.au so people can go on there if you run a small business if you are running thinking about um, an equity program for example you can jump on there help to see what's working see what experiences other companies have had in trying to um, hire more diversely um, improve their internal structures and processes and policies um, and really giving people a guide on how to implement workplace change that can improve um, the workplace for everyone so all of that stuff is you know sort of a strategic um, look in relation to the um, 10-year decadal plan for women in STEM that was written about three or four years ago now. It's about that coordination, that leadership, that evaluation. Um, and seeing this as a scientific project, it's not simple to change yeah. the world. It, it's, a, it's a difficult thing and people need guidance. So we and others like the Workplace Gender Equality Agency try to support with, um, with resources so that people know what to do and uh, get some guidance and help. Well, well, I've just literally come off the back of a, another meeting. We're preparing for uh, IPSEC uh, in Perth uh, in October, and we're looking to do an education stream on that and bringing in uh, school principals. So uh, literally this is uh, very relevant uh, to even those kind of discussions as well for the sector and the industry to, to take note of. Now, this is an equity monitor uh, 2023. What's the sort of the program map for this monitoring? How often are you doing this as a... Yeah, how lineal is it? Yeah, so the, the, it, this is run by the Department of Industry within the Commonwealth Government. Um, I don't actually run the, the data monitor myself, I but I respond to it and I use it as a tool um, to try and then provide policy advice and business advice for the sector. Um, it's every year um, and it's fu been funded for a number of years now um, and hopefully will continue into the future. That's certainly something that I think is a um, yeah, pivotal in our in our toolbox um, to to help to understand this issue. If you if you can't see data, you you you're in the dark. Yeah. So um, hopefully this will be shining a light for many years to help us to monitor. Okay, like we've got together the you know the gender gap in in sciences and and maths in year twelve is close to you know pretty much zero now. Let's focus on IT and engineering. Let's focus on those technology subjects and give young people um, some really great guidance and programs like Future U, which we run again, with Commonwealth funding, help yeah. to help to achieve that. Well, and it is uh, the, the rewards are paid off, you know, years down in advance. So I'm, I'm glad that they're doing it every year. Uh, so that way a, a cohort of students don't necessarily miss out uh, as well. I think that's very important. Um, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith, it's great to have you back. Uh, continue with your great work as the Australian Government's Women in STEM Ambassador. And thanks very much for joining us again on Australia and Space TV. Terrific. Thanks very much.